and now we can, <laughs> we can do what the good Lord has called us to do. Good evening. Good evening. It's great to have so many of you back for night three, our concluding night of our mission. Um, as we gather tonight, you know, we're mindful always, of course, of where we've been so that we can know where we're going. And at the first night, we spent looking at the Word of God. You know, so much of our Eucharistic life, our Eucharistic experience when we come from Mass, centers on the Word. Often we hear from the Old Testament, from the New Testament, and then, of course, always from the Gospel. And the Psalms, of course, always find their way there as well. Those songs of praise, those songs of lamentation, those songs of humanity. It's so good that we've been praying the Liturgy of the Hours at the beginning of this mission each night, because it's a treasure that belongs to the church to pray the, the prayers that Jesus would have prayed as a child and as man. He was a good Jew, and so the Psalms were near and dear to his heart as well. And what we talked about on night one was the notion that God has a personal word for each and every one of us. So as we pray with the scripture, as we return again and again to the word, we should expect to hear a word from God and trust that God will be faithful to His Word. But it's more than just reading, and it's more than just studying. Catholics, the Lord have mercy since the Second Vatican Council, we have gotten on the Bible study train, and there are multiple stops, and we love to study the Bible. Study, 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 study. Who cares if you know a lot about the Bible, but it has no effect in your daily life? You then are just a walking box, a train in pursuit. Good for you. <laughs> the study is good, but the study comes forth and flows from our prayer and feeds our prayer in return. Right? So that it's not just studying who said what, where, why, when, and how, but asking questions like, so what? What does this teaching of Jesus mean? Or what did Ruth mean when she said to Naomi, wherever you go, I will go. Where you live, I will live, and your people will be my people. And you are God, my God. What does it mean, right? And how does that touch all? I'm convinced that God has a personal word for us that is to be written on our heart. And the second part of Mass, of the sacramental, the liturgy of the Eucharist, is this notion of sacrament, and sacraments cause change. Certainly they are the outward sign of the invisible presence of God's grace, by all means, yes. But that sacraments also do things, they affect change. At Mass, bread and wine become body and blood, and we who consume the body and blood of Christ are to become that which we eat, bread for the world. We're to be Eucharist, living and breathing for the world. We're to be changed. Reconciliation. Every time we go to reconciliation, we go from one who has disconnected himself or herself to being reconnected. Our relationship with God changes, always for the better of reconciliation. It changes. But all of this, so far, in some way, is directed as what's happening in our relationship with God. It's very intimate and very personal. But there's more to it, of course, than just the intimate and personal connection we have at the Eucharist. It's one of the tensions in our faith. How often is it that when we come to church, we really are kind of coming with a me and God mindset. This is my God time. It's nice that you're here, but sit over there and don't come too close. It's the flu season, don't shake hands. You know? Don't come too close. You do your thing. I'll be my thing. If we happen to be doing the same thing together every once in a while, well, that's okay too, right? But that's not really what Mass is at all. Eucharist, the celebration of Mass, is the people of God coming together as one community to give praise to God. And we ask God not only to change us individually, but to change us, to change the community. To change the world. Do we recognize that that's part of our prayer? We pray, whenever Christians pray, we pray not just for ourselves, not just for the needs on our list, but we pray for every human being, always. Imagine that God invites us to share in so great a responsibility. And this notion that Eucharist 
is something that is beyond ourselves is also expressed very clearly in the teaching of our Holy Father, Pope Francis. Pope Francis has focused a number of times on the notion of the church being mission. That's what I want to talk about tonight. Pope Francis, early in his pontificate, said, a church that is closed in on herself and in the past, a church that only sees the little rules of behavior, of attitude, is a church that betrays her own identity. A closed church betrays her own identity. Then let us rediscover today all the beauty and responsibility of being the church apostolic. And remember this, the church is apostolic because we pray our first day, and because we proclaim the gospel by our life and by our words. One of the first things Pope Francis said about the church was that she's apostolic. In other words, she's outward looking. She's about mission. She's about going forth from her house and inviting others in. He said, evangelization or evangelizing is the church's mission. We must all be evangelizers, especially with our lives. And Paul VI stressed this that evangelization is the grace and vocation proper to the church, it is her deepest identity. And finally, in coming down upon the apostles, the Holy Spirit makes them leave the room they have locked themselves into out of fear. He prompts them to step out of themselves and transforms them into heralds and witness of the mighty works of God. Probably the most important <coughs> line, the Holy Spirit makes them leave the room into which they had locked themselves out of fear. Because I don't know about you, but I like being comfortable. It's easy for me to preach missions to people like all y'all. You're here. You're here on Sunday. You believe. Some of you have uniforms on tonight. I know you believe. You have your ag shirts on. Right? So it's easy to preach to you. The likelihood of you saying, Father, you're full of something, while the Irish malarkey is slim to none. You may think it, but you're probably not going to say it. You know, it's an easy crowd. It's not easy, though, when it's my own monastic community. It's not always easy when it's a bunch of seminarians who are really deeply in love with the Lord and at a point in their life where whether they want to admit it or not, every time I say something, they're judging as to whether they think it's right or not right. Whether it's something they should follow or, oh, that's Father Brendan being Father Brendan. <laughs> it's the nature of the beast. It's not, there's nothing wrong with seminarians. I have the greatest seminarians around. It's just the reality of we live together 24-7 and there ain't no prophet welcome in his own hometown. Right? We, get, we get sick of one another. We know one another. But this notion that Eucharist is supposed to send us forth is something that we hear even in the context of Mass. You know, at the end of Mass, you hear things like, go in peace, the Mass is ended. Well, it's not just go in peace, it's not just a good wish for you. Other options include, go and announce the Gospel of the Lord. That's my favorite, that's the one I typically use. Go and announce the Gospel. Because it's your job. It's my job. It's the job of everyone who's been baptized. And if we take seriously this notion that the Word of God written on our hearts in the liturgy of the Word, and the sacramental experience, the transformation, the transubstantiation, right, the change of our being, at least of the body, of the bread and wine, the body and blood, but also we hope the change of our own self, right, that leads us then to action, to action. I want to share with you one of my favorite scripture stories. It's a long one. It's a whole lot. But it's well worth it. Because it's one of the most amazing stories for me of an encounter with Jesus. Trust me, you'll hear it again uh, pretty darn soon in this holy season of Lent. We have it on, I think it's the third or fourth Sunday. Jesus had to pass through Samaria. So he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar near the plot of the land that Jacob had given to his son. 
Jacob's well was there. Jesus, tired from his journey, sat down there at the well. It was about noon. A woman of Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. His disciples had gone into town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How can you, a Jew, ask me, a Samaritan woman, for a drink? For Jews use nothing in common with Samaritans. Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God and who is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you do not even have a bucket, and the cistern is deep. Where then can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the cistern and drank from it himself, with his children and his flocks? Jesus answered and said to her, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I shall give will never thirst. The water I shall give will become in him a spring of water, welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water, so that I may not be thirsty or have to keep coming here to draw water. Jesus said to her, Go call your husband and come back. The woman answered him and said, I do not have a husband. Jesus answered her, saying, You are right in saying, I do not have a husband. For you have had five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to him, Sir, I can see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you people say that the place to worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus said to her, Believe me, woman, the hour is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You people worship what you do not understand. We worship what we understand because salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. And indeed, the Father seeks such people to worship Him. God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. The woman said to him, I know that the Messiah is coming, the one called the Anointed. When he comes, he will tell us everything. Jesus said to her, I am he, the one who is speaking with you. At that moment, his disciples returned and were amazed that he was talking with a woman. But still no one said, what are you looking for? Or, why are you talking with her? The woman left her water jar and went into the town and said to the people, Come and see a man who told me everything I have done. (coughs) Could he possibly be the Messiah? They went out of the town and came to him. Meanwhile, his disciples urged him, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have no food to eat of which you do not know. I have food of which to eat you do not know. So the disciples said to one another, Could someone have brought him something to eat? Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of the one who sent me and finish his work. Do you not say in four months the harvest will be here? I tell you, look up and see the uh, the fields ripe for the harvest. The reaper is already receiving his payment and gathering crops for eternal life, so that the sower and reaper can rejoice together. For here the saying is verified that one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap what you have not worked for. Others have done the work, and you are sharing the fruits of their work. Many of the Samaritans of that town began to believe in him because of the word of the woman who testified, He told me everything I have done. When the Samaritans came to him, they invited him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. Many more began to believe in him because of his word. And they said to the woman, We no longer believe because of your word, for we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this is truly the Savior of the world. The story of the Samaritan woman is a long gospel reading. It's one of those in Lent that we'll, we'll hear. But it's such an important one, because what happens, and what is so beautiful, is Jesus has an encounter with this woman, and 
and she is forever changed. Notice in this encounter, the woman didn't start anything. Jesus was where he needed to be, which was at that well. She came along and he spoke first. Woman, give me a drink. And that's all it took. Give me a drink. Began an engagement, an encounter between the Samaritan woman and Jesus. And what happened over the course of their encounter was they both revealed the truth of who they were. Jesus said to her, if only you had known who it was that was giving you water, you would ask for it because this is life-giving water. Jesus says to this woman, I am he, the anointed one. To a Samaritan woman at the well at noon, the wrong type of woman at the wrong place in the wrong time. Jesus says, I'm the guy that everybody's looking for. It's me. And then he says to her, go get your husband. She makes no excuses. She tells no lies. She simply says, I do not have one. I don't have one. And Jesus says, you speak the truth. You have shown me yourself. You spoke the truth. And what does he do? Except continue to be in relationship with her. To give her the water. Brothers and sisters, encounters with God change us. If we allow them to do that. And when we are changed, when the Lord has touched our heart, then it changes us in such a way that we cannot keep the good news to ourselves. She was compelled to go back to the very people who have rejected her in the first place. She's at the well at noon. Women don't go to the well at noon. They go in the morning and they go in the evening and they go like they go to the bathroom today in groups of 10 or 20. <laughs> they don't go by themselves. Don't know why, they just don't. But women never went to the well alone because it was dangerous. You took your life in your hands. She went back to the people who so rejected her that she could not go to the well with the women at the normal time. And she proclaimed, he has told me everything I have ever done. I think it's him. Come and meet him. And then what happens, of course, the people go and meet Jesus, and then they tell her right to her face, hey, listen, thanks for the message you proclaimed, but we want to make darn sure you know this ain't because of what you've said. We now believe because of who he is. That is what this is all about. There are so many televangelists, there are so many big personalities, even sometimes in our own church, and things happen where it becomes the cult of the person, right? The pastor, oh, it's the Church of St. Mary's, you know, and we have Father Jack, and as soon as Father Jack gets reassigned, man, wherever he goes, that's where I'm going. I'm not sticking here because this isn't my parish. It's not about Jesus, it's about Father Jack. Or, I'm going with Nance because I know we're done in 47 minutes. <laughs> He's the best preacher ever. He doesn't say anything, but he's quick about it. <laughs> That's not true, Father Todd. They all say you say something. So. <laughs> but notice, sometimes we get confused, right? And we forget what it's all about. When the story of the woman, the Samaritan woman, we hear very clearly, she testifies about Jesus, she draws people to him, and then they begin to have their own encounters. <clears throat> she brings them to Jesus. Maybe she even introduces them. I want you, Bill, to meet this guy, Jesus. Jesus, meet Bill. And then she lets it develop on its own. Hardest lesson about being a disciple and evangelizer, you cannot give anyone else faith. You cannot make a person have a conversion. You cannot give them faith. And let's make it crystal clear, you don't save anybody. Jesus is the Savior. <clears throat> Jesus draws us to the Father. Jesus is the heart of who we are and what we do. But once we know that, 
then we cannot help but invite others to meet him. Francis, Pope Francis said to us in the Evangelium Gaudium, the joy of the gospel, he said, you know, there are way too many Christians that come out of church looking like they just come from a funeral. They're sad. And just, woe is us. We have just watched bread become body, blood become wine. Jesus has offered himself, has given himself to us, and has said, take and eat. And we walk out of here thinking, well, thank God that's over. Wow. How quick are we to forget what's just happened? And the last word of the Mass is the invitation to go forth and announce the Gospel of the Lord. To be heralds, to be evangelists, to share the good news. That's why as a preacher, it's certainly incumbent upon me, upon Father Jack, upon Monsignor Dorney, upon any priest, to be proclaimers of joy. You know, there was a cheesy song from the 70s or 80s, We are Mr. People, right? We love that. We are. But we are an Easter people. We should be rejoicing. We put the A word away for 40 days. But that word of right now, if you're thinking about it, you're like, A word, what is he talking about? <laughs> I, if I say it, I'm throwing the whole thing off. But it usually happens right before the gospel. Uh, you got it? You with me? All right, you got the word. Good, good, good. Right? We are supposed to be people constantly giving praise to God. So if we believe what is supposed to happen happens at Mass, then really what we're opening ourselves up to, what we have to make room in our heart and our mind, our soul for, is a willingness to become preachers of the gospel. Now, of course, St. Francis said to us, preach the gospel always, if necessary, use words. I want to share with you one time where I saw the gospel clearly preached and not a word was spoken. I was in parish ministry, I was an associate pastor, and it was the custom of this parish that when a person asked for the anointing of the sick, they were invited to the Tuesday night mass, usually a small crowd of people, they were invited to the Tuesday night mass, and the anointing took place after the homily, right? Normal place where you insert sort of sacraments in a, in a mass, in a Eucharistic celebration. And in this particular parish, this woman came, and I have Kim's permission to share this story. Kim came, and she had said, Father, I'm, I, I have to have surgery, it's cancer. And, uh, Scared, and I'd really like the anointing. Of course, Kim, absolutely. Tuesday night, you come, we'll have it. So Kim comes, and she comes with her four girls, uh, her three girls. Uh, Dad was never with us that night. The littlest one is four year old Kelly. Oh my gosh, black hair, big doe eyes, cute little girl, four year old Kelly. So here we are, um, we're doing the uh, laying on of hands. It was the custom of that parish that after the priest laid hands, he invited again the small congregation to lay hands on her as well. So I've laid hands on Kim, and the congregation is coming up one after the other, and they all do that, and they go back to their place. And as I'm about ready to move on to the anointing, I notice that standing at the front pew is four-year-old Kelly, and she's doing this. And she's giving me a look that says, <clears throat> hey, dummy. And I'm looking at her, She's looking at me. She didn't call me dummy. Just had that look. Hey, dummy. And the Holy Spirit said, well, okay. You know, you listen to her. Okay, so I pick Kelly up and I turn her around and I stand in front of her mother. And Kelly immediately lays hands on her mother. Now, imagine four-year-old Kelly is laying hands on her mother, whose head is shaken up and down because she is now crying like a fool. Kelly is not crying, she's all smiling. The father is shaking the child up and down because he is crying like a fool. The congregation is all crying because this child got it. Now, is it entirely possible that this four-year-old was just doing what all the other adults did? Of course, it's entirely possible. But is it also not possible for God to have spoken in the heart of that child and for that four-year-old to realize that we are a Christian people and the gospel isn't something we just hear or receive. It's something we live. She saw others praying for her mother. Was it just mimicry? Or was it true mimesis? Was it putting on Christ and being Christ-like? I don't know that I ever want the answer. Because in the beauty of a four-year-old, it's either or both ends. 
apparently taught us all in that church something. The four-year-old got it. That the Word of God is not just something we hear, it's something we live. We live. Brothers and sisters, if we don't get that, if we don't embrace the fact that the gospel is an invitation not just to grow personally with the Lord, but to be a bridge for others to grow in their relationship with God, well, then we've missed something entirely. And we cannot help others grow in their relationship with God by bullying them, or by scare tactics, or by threatening them with hell. I mean, seriously, when was the last time you accepted a dinner invitation if someone told you, look, you are not the nicest person in the parish, but I feel obliged to invite you to dinner, so I want you to know I am going to cook my absolute worst meal, serve it to you on burnt paper plates that have been recycled, which means I just scraped off last night's dinner, because that's all you deserve. I would hope not for your own sake, right? But sometimes we use scare tactics. <clears throat> well, you better believe in Jesus or else. Well, that doesn't sound very inviting. Doesn't sound very inviting. true. At least part of that statement may be true, but it's not the whole truth. Wouldn't you much rather hear me say, "Do you like Italian? I love Italian." <laughs> I hear that Father Jack is a good cook of Italian food. I do not know this firsthand because he didn't cook for me, he took me out tonight. But Father Todd said that he knows that Father Jack can cook Italian food. So I'm inviting you, the next time I'm in town, to have some Italian food with Father Jack. Right? That sounds a lot more inviting. It sounds a lot more inviting. And the thing about it is, in that invitation, notice, I ain't cooking what Jack is. I'm not your pastor, Father Jack is. And in an invitation like that, there's going to be conversation. And so then you and Father Jack will connect. Wow. How are we connecting other people what witness are we giving? What difference does Mass make when we leave this church? Now, sometimes it may be we have people in our family who have been away from Mass for years, and so our approach is, you got to go to Mass. you got to go to Mass. you got to go to Mass. Every time they're in our presence, I'm going to Mass. You want to come with me? I'm going to Mass. You want to come with me? I'm going to Mass. You want to come with me? You're usually not very effective. But a conversation, especially with ones we love. You know what? You're right. It's Christmas time. You're an adult. You're, you're 15 and you think you're an adult and you want to make all these choices on your own. Well, if you're 15 and you're still living under your roof, parents, please fight with them. It's worth it. Because let me tell you this about that. Those things that you do not fight your children over, the only message you then give to your children is this. It's not important. It doesn't matter. Please hear that and know that. Even though the last thing you want to do is fight with teams because they're really good at it. If you don't, the only message they hear is it didn't matter. Because you fight over everything that matters. If you don't fight over mass tenets, it doesn't matter. But with other people, you may invite from time to time, hey, I'm going to mass, would you like to join me? No. Let it rest. And then pray. Pray for the gift of hunger. Pray for the gift of hunger. One of the greatest things we have in this Mass that we celebrate is the Eucharist, the body and blood of the Lord. And ain't nobody got it quite like we got it. And you can go all over the place and try and get any substitute you want. But trust me, it's like saccharin, stevie, it's splenda, the blue stuff, the yellow stuff, the other stuff. It ain't the real thing. And it only masks Trust me, you get hungry enough, you're going to search out what you require. Pray for the gift of hunger. Lord, place upon him or her a hunger for your Eucharist. And then show them how you are fed by the Eucharist. 
See, we have to become a Eucharistic witness by the way we live, by the way we move, by the way we have our being in this world. You're a prophet, and so are you. And you, and you, and every last one of us. Because we've heard the word, and now we have to live it. A four-year-old taught me what it looks like when we live the word. Even if she didn't fully understand it, she knew she had to do something. And she did. What do we do? What do we do? That's part of it. We're called to be mission, right? Invite. Invite. If you know folks in your neighborhood that aren't churched, they don't have any church. Hey, everyone's well invite them. No safety. You know, if there's a home church, there's this great church called the Church of St. Mary. It's a really welcoming community. Why don't you come with me one Sunday? Why don't you know you're welcome anytime? Or better yet, not only when you say that you're welcome anytime, mean it. Do something absolutely crazy this Lent and buy someone an Easter card and handwrite an invitation. You would be shocked. You know why? Because people don't get invitations anymore. They get emails. And they get Facebook events and tweeted at. Right? Hey, party, come. That's it. That was the invitation. You don't even know where but you're going to show up because that was a big party, come. Right? Step out of the box. And notice how insignificant and not big a deal it is. I didn't say join a community. I didn't say commit the rest of your life. But one step at a time, share the good news. If you hear a really inspiring homily from Father Jack, I know you do. Share it with somebody. Take that one word or phrase and share it with somebody. You don't even have to say, hey, first step to me. You can begin with, hey, you know, I heard the other day, and someone just might say to you, that's pretty good. Where did you hear that? I heard it from this priest named Father Jack. Would you like to meet him? He's at the same place every Saturday and Sunday, 5, 8, 10, 30, 5, 5. Would you like to meet him? And then see what happens. In your own life, brothers and sisters, in the area that you're struggling with, with your prayer and your relationship with God, become a missionary to yourself. Bring that to the Lord. Bring it to Mass, place it at the altar, but don't leave it here as if the work is not is finished. You got to do something with it. You got to do something with it. Whatever your struggle is, you have to ask God not only for the grace, but you have to continue to work with it. <coughs> because we're missionary disciples. And here's where the rubber meets the road our faith cannot be a 60 minute a week experience, and it cannot be an experience that's limited to this building or to the safety of our own home. Parents may pray at home with their children, but do you pray when you go out to dinner? I mean, that's the crazy thing. This is a simple evangelization tool, right here. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. That's an evangelization tool. You will look crazy, and some people they will look at you like, what are they doing? And one day someone will ask, and you'll have the opportunity to tell them. Our Baptist brothers and sisters, you've got to love our Baptist brothers and sisters. They are afraid to pray nowhere at no time. They will pray anywhere, anytime, and when they get started, they're going to thank Father God for everything. <laughs> and they're not a so We, it's sort of like, look to the left, look to the right. Nobody's looking at me. <laughs> Now don't make a project out of it, please. Don't stand up and say, excuse me, everybody. <laughs> but don't be afraid. It's simply living. It's what we're called to do if we live this. If we're Eucharist brothers, amazing things happen. Amazing things happen. So, Kelly taught us about the power of believing in this encounter. Tammy learned how to give to God the heavy thing on her heart. You and I, we're called to do the same as those two beautiful women. We're called to do the same. That's the beauty of Eucharist. So never underestimate the power of the final blessing and the words.
Lord's go in peace, or the Mass is ended, or go and announce the gospel of the lives, or go and be transformed, or whatever. So never underestimate the power of those words. And brothers and sisters, do not underestimate the power of this season. We live in Lent right now. And Lent isn't a destination. It's a preparation. Easter is not an epilogue to our story. It's the climax. So allow Lent to be a period of preparation to celebrate. Think about all the things that we do at home to get ready for holidays. We deck the halls, we buy gifts, we wrap the wrappings, we bake cakes, we get cards, we get excited, we turn on music, we invite people, we get so happy, and then we celebrate. Unless you're Catholic celebrating Easter or getting ready for Easter and Lent. And then it's like, put everything that's fun away, be miserable. (laughs) And I know, make everyone else suffer by the sacrifices I give up. (laughs) Happy Easter. Right? Doesn't make sense. So let's not miss the mark. Let's not be a Tim the Tool Man Taylor. Let's not sin. Let's be on target. Let's be on target, and let's enter the beauty of the mystery of the Mass. Let us listen to God's Word. Let us be changed by the grace of the sacrament, and let us become missionary disciples who spread the good news and who draw others, who invite others. Let us make people curious about the mystery, the paschal mystery of Jesus Christ, His resurrection by the way we live our lives. Let them see your Christian joy so much so that a person asks, how can someone with such a lousy life be so happy? How can you be so joyful? And the answer is because I know Jesus. Because I know Jesus. Wow. We know we live in a world where people are always looking for joy. We also know we live in a world where people look in all the wrong places. So let's show them the right place. It's not a place at all, it's a person. It's the person of Jesus Christ. And let's leave others to encounter. Thank you. A special word of thanks, and see, some of them are Dr. Erbacher, you will be in bed, I promise you, by 8.20. Uh, I do want to say uh, thank you. So Deacon Rich Bender has really kind of taken everything um, under his wing to, uh, to recruit. Um, but special word thanks to Jake Zoki, Mike Malcolm, um, I think we're all working on this together, kind of all the technical stuff, and recording, and getting all the details. But thank you to, um, especially in our, our acts ministry that volunteered uh, for our, uh, the food every, every evening, which again this evening, they did that. There were greeters and uh, anyway, so really just a, a lot of people who did a lot of work to, uh, to put on the mission, make it uh, kind of lay the groundwork for that. So thank you very much for all that. Um, a special <laughs> So, Father Brendan, I thought he started off a little rocky on that first night when he was asking us how big our butt was. <laughs> and tonight, you know, didn't set the best example. We tell our kids, okay, have you gone to the bathroom before you can <laughs> <laughs> And I'm really concerned because I think Monsignor Dorney has never thought that it was an option for him to leave and go to the bathroom. <laughs> But you, you set a great example in your, uh, in your generosity. Um, you're a, a busy priest, you know, a rector of a seminary. You do lots of things, and your willingness to come and to share. And, and many things, it was kind of naming some things that we knew, you know, and it was sharing a lot of the new stuff, but really it was a, it was a passion. You know, and, um, so opening our minds, but really inflaming our hearts. So. Thank you for your great example. Thank you for your vocation, for your willingness to witness to us the power of Jesus Christ in your
life and to share that with us. So many, many thanks for being with us. Great job. And if you would give us your blessing to send us into uh, the reception in Beckerley Hall. Let's sing. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go and announce the gospel of the Lord.